Hi everyone, I'm Lauren, in partnership with the National Catholic Bioethics Center. We are going to be discussing some basic bioethical principles and their application to human decision making in the pursuit of the moral life. This is Base Elements. How do we as people know things? There is of course the scientific method with its measurements and experiments. But there are many things in life that can't be measured. How do you know someone loves you? How do you know what's right and what's wrong? What happens when the world tells us that every person gets to decide what's good? How can we truly know what actions are good and what actions are bad if there are no criteria by which we can assess our actions? Moral theology contains tools to help supplement our decision-making process when facing questions like these. One of these tools is called the principle of double effect. In the course of human events, actions have both good and bad effects. The principle of double effect is used to assess such actions to determine if they are morally acceptable or not. It is particularly useful in determining what is good or bad in cases of medical decisions. The formulation of double effect has been given in a variety of ways, but one of the most widely accepted presentations uses four conditions, all of which must be met in order for the action to be judged morally sound. The first of the four criteria is that the action in and of itself must be morally good or morally neutral. The second is that the good effect and not the bad effect is intended. The third is that the good effect cannot be produced by means of the bad effect. And the fourth is that there is a proportionately grave reason for permitting the bad effect. Some actions by their very nature are bad. These actions violate the natural law that is the basis of human conscience. This natural law can be known and understood by all people of goodwill and is independent of creed, culture, or time. Actions against natural law include those opposed to life itself, those that violate the integrity of the human person, intentional torment of the body or mind, attempts to control the will, and those that insult human dignity. No action with a bad nature could be justified using the principle of double effect, since according to the first criterion, the action in question must be morally good, or at least morally neutral. The second condition requires that the good effect and not the bad effect be intended. In order for this criterion to be met, the bad effect must only be foreseen and not intended. This can be a subtle distinction. If you know something is going to happen, doesn't that mean you intend for it to happen? This is not necessarily the case. Intention includes both the goal you want to achieve, as well as the means you choose to achieve it. Together, the second and third criteria of double effect evaluate whether one's intention is good. The second criteria focuses on the first part of this description, the goal you want to achieve. The very fact that you are using double effect indicates that you don't want the bad effect to occur and that it therefore is not included in this aspect of your intention. The third criterion refers to the second half of the description of intention and states that the good effect must not be produced by the bad effect. In other words, the ends don't justify the means. If both this and the previous criterion are satisfied, you don't intend the bad effect either as the goal in and of itself or as the way of achieving your goal. Consequently, you can be reasonably certain that the bad effect is a true side effect of your good action. The fourth criterion is that there must be proportionality between the good and bad effects. This isn't so much a mathematical equation or a matter of balance. Rather, it means that actions which have a bad effect cannot be chosen for convenience or ease. Proportionality also means that you cannot achieve a small good while inadvertently causing a great evil. This criterion can be one of the most difficult to assess, since some of the goods taken into consideration are only perspective, and the bad effects they are measured against are all too certain. Now let's review an example of an ectopic pregnancy to practice putting the principle into action. In this case, the embryo has implanted in the fallopian tube instead of in the lining of the uterus. This can become dangerous for the mother, because as the embryo grows, the fallopian tube can begin to tear and bleed. 
There are three primary treatment options. You can remove the fallopian tube through a procedure called a salpingectomy. You can perform a salpingostomy by opening the fallopian tube and surgically removing the embryo. Or you can administer a drug such as methotrexate to dislodge the embryo from the fallopian tube. What can you do to save the mother's life while respecting the dignity of the other patient, her unborn child? Working through each option shows that salpingectomy clearly satisfies the principle of double effect, while salpingostomy and methotrexate appear not to. Preventing a dangerous tear in the fallopian tube is clearly a morally good action, satisfying the first criterion. The physician is intending to save the life of the woman, not harm the embryo satisfying the second criterion. The third criterion is where we will find our first opportunity to see the nuance of the principle. If the physician chooses to remove the embryo from the fallopian tube, the third criterion is not met since the physician is directing his action against the innocent life of the embryo, either by surgically cutting into its trophoblast or by using medication to stop the trophoblast cell division. That is, the tear in the fallopian tube is prevented by directly harming the embryo. But if the whole length of unhealthy fallopian tube is removed, the third criterion is satisfied because the tear is prevented by removing the diseased fallopian tube, and the physical integrity of the embryo is not violated in any way. The fourth criterion is satisfied since if the mother dies, the child will also die, and there is no alternative course of action that will save both her and her unborn child. Additionally, saving the mother's life is a great good. As this ectopic pregnancy example shows, double effect upholds the foundational moral principles that require respect for the gift of life. The principle of double effect can be applied to many situations when your actions have a good and a bad effect, and it can help provide a guide to the best moral decision. I hope you enjoyed this introduction to the principle of double effect. If you found this explanation helpful, please like this video and subscribe to the National Catholic Bioethics Center for more information on Catholic bioethics. Also, you can find links in the description for more resources on double effect and maternal fetal conflicts like ectopic pregnancies.